Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 27th annual African, African American, and Caribbean Studies Virtual Institute. I'm Kim Coombs, the Holocaust Studies Program Plan Planner for the School District of Palm Beach County. And I'm truly honored to be here today with Maureen Carter and Christina Chavaria. Christina is the program coordinator at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, William Levine Family Institute for Holocaust Education. And we are so grateful to have Christina here with us today. Christina has been a partner with the United States, with the School District of Palm Beach County for many years and provided numerous trainings to students and teachers across our district. And we are grateful to have Christina with us. Today, Christina is gonna talk about the 1936 Berlin Olympics and its impact on the United States. Welcome, Christina. Hi, Kim. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of the Institute this summer. I'm thrilled because, as you know, because we've worked together for so many years, um, the School District of Palm Beach County is a partner in our conference for Holocaust Education Centers. So we will continue to build on our relationship to provide teacher professional development um, for teachers in Palm Beach County. So thank you again for this very gracious invitation. Uh, this is a very important topic. And I also wanna say that we are joined today by our very good friend and colleague, Maureen Carter, who many of you know, because she served as the Holocaust Administrator for K through 12 education with the School District of Palm Beach County. Um, and Maureen has extensive uh, background in Holocaust education and in the field and is very knowledgeable. So she will be working with us today. So Maureen, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Chris. And um, can you tell us a little bit about the 1936 Berlin Olympics? Sure, so we're going to be sharing information about the Olympic games of 1936. We commonly call them the Nazi Olympics because this was part of the Nazi era, which began in 1933 and ended in 1945. And these Olympics have been written about and they've been discussed often. And the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum here in Washington, D.C. has developed many resources to help educators teach about this topic, but also not just to talk about the Olympics and, and teach about the Olympics itself, but to provide the historical context that surrounds it, especially the historical context in the United States at the time. So we hope that after you have watched this presentation, that you will integrate these resources into what you are teaching. And hopefully you can do so and find that these resources are not an add-on and that the subject of the Olympics isn't an add-on, something extra to teach, but how does it fit into our understanding of American history in the 1930s and 1940s as the growing Nazi threat was occurring in Europe and as we faced many issues here in the United States, uh, economically, uh, socially, and in many other factors. Um, and because this was an issue that Americans debated over, um, should we attend the Olympics or not? and as a result of what was happening in Nazi Germany at the time. So we can go to um, that debate in the next slide. And as we look at this debate, one of the things that, that we wanna consider is again, the context of the Olympics. Um, so as we know, when the Olympic games are, are going to happen, we see how countries step forward and they put forth a proposal on why they should be awarded or certain cities actually, they put forth a proposal on why they should be awarded the Olympic games. Um, and the International Olympic Committee then chooses the particular city. Um, and so in 1931, Germany was awarded the 1936 games. And it was the first time that both the summer and the winter games of 1936 would be held in one city, in one country. Um, so that was very unusual. 
And one of the things that we also have to realize is at that time, nobody protested that really because um, there was not yet the Nazi rise to power. The Nazi party was not yet in power. Hitler was not yet chancellor. He, that didn't happen until 1933. Um, so almost um, within a year or two after Hitler comes to power, this debate begins um, in many countries about um, boycotting the Olympics of 1936, because we have to remember that there's now been, uh, by 1935, a year before, the Nazis have been in power for two years and the world is seeing what is happening in Germany, especially against certain groups and primarily against uh, German Jews. So the movement to boycott the 1936 Olympics starts in the United States, but Britain, France, Sweden, and Czechoslovakia and the Netherlands also debated whether they should send teams to the Olympic Games. Um, and it was primarily in the United States that this was a huge um, subject of, of talk because we tend to send the largest, one of the largest teams to the Games. Um, and some boycott proponents even propose that maybe there should be a counter Olympics games. Um, there was the People's Olympiad that was planned for the summer of 1936 in Barcelona, but those games never took place because the Spanish Civil War broke out at that time, just as athletes were arriving to compete in Barcelona. Um, also, individual Jewish athletes from a number of countries chose to boycott the games on their own, um, or they even boycotted the trials, the qualifying trials. And this also um, was something of discussion and something that Jewish athletes in the United States also felt they needed to do. Um, the American Jewish Congress and the Jewish Labor Committee, both in the United States, did support the boycott as well. And a number of Catholic politicians and a lot of um, presidents of colleges and universities also felt that we should boycott the games because of the, um, because of the ongoing persecution and the increasing persecution against German Jews and, and other groups at the time. So um, even though these debates were happening, the Amateur Athletic Union of the United States uh, put this to a vote, a closed vote in December of 1935. Um, and this basically killed is officially this, um, this debate and it was decided that we should go to the Olympics. Um, so Christina, who, um, can you tell us a little bit about who was in favor of participating in the games? Sure. So the people behind the movement for us to continue to participate in the games were um, people like Avery Brundage. So you see Avery Brundage in the picture on the right. Um, and here's a quote. Uh, he, he said that the Olympic Games belong to the athletes and not to the politicians. Um, and that's a, that is that comes up often that sports and politics should not mix. But we see that going on in many different ways even today. Um, and so when we look at this quote, um, people say that, but in, in reality, um, they, they often do mix. So for Brundage, he wrote in the American Olympic Committee's pamphlet, Fair Play for American Athletes, that American athletes should not become involved in quote, the present Jew-Nazi altercation. And then as the Olympics controversy heated up in 1935, Brundage, who was known to be anti-Semitic, um, alleged an existence of a Jewish communist conspiracy to keep the United States out of the game. So anti-Semitism was not something that was confined only to Nazi Germany. It was alive and well, unfortunately in the United States and, and still is a, a very severe problem. So um, when the Amateur Athletic Union defeated the proposal to boycott the Olympic Games, um, he was behind that movement, Brundage. Now, people like President Roosevelt, who comes up often in, in these debates and what his role was, President Roosevelt never gave an opinion publicly on his thoughts on whether we should boycott the games. 
but many newspapers actually, uh, major newspapers like the New York Times and Washington Post, they called for us to boycott the games. Um, and especially after 1935, September 1935, when the Nuremberg laws were put into place in Germany, which stripped German Jews of their citizenship and prohibited them from marrying or having relationships with non-Jews, um, that was when more people started to say that we should be boycotting the games. Um, so, so there were individuals that actually favored a boycott. Can you tell us about some of those individuals? Sure. So, so as I mentioned, many of these individuals um, supported this movement and did so even more after the Nuremberg Laws. And one of them was Ernest Lee Jenke, who is pictured right here on the left-hand side. Uh, he was a member of the International Olympic Committee, and he was actually taken off the committee after the debate ended for the United States. So he, um, he opposed going to the Olympics on the grounds that um, that the the Nazi um, the Nazi government was persecuting people, primarily German Jews. Um, there had been outcry among certain segments of the American population about this since the Nazi rise to power, especially in the American uh, Jewish community. Um, and the man also who we see on the right, Jeremiah Mahoney, also opposed. United States participation in the Olympic Games. But as we know, that, that movement to boycott was defeated. Um, thank you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, there must have been um, some uh, debate going on in the African-American community. Can you tell us about that? Sure. So. Um, Yes, there was a great deal of debate, and it and it was really um, it ranged from person to person, and there was pressure put on the athletes themselves, black American athletes who were going to compete or who were up in the trials um, to qualify to go to the Olympics. So many American newspaper editors and anti-Nazi groups um, called for the boycott, as we know. But most African American newspapers opposed boycotting the games um, for different reasons. So writers from the Philadelphia Tribune and the Chicago Defender, two prominent black American uh, newspapers, they argued that victories by back black athletes would undermine racism and the myth of Aryan supremacy. So they hoped that victories by athletes such as Jesse Owens and Ralph Metcalf would bring a sense of pride to black Americans. Um, and they also highlighted the fact that many of these athletes wanted to compete in the games to disprove Nazi racial theories. Um, others felt, others in the black American community felt that the Olympics would give African Americans opportunities for advancement. Um, in the 1930s, Jim Crow laws legalize discrimination against non-whites in, in most areas of American life. Um, you had segregated schools, you had segregated military, hotels, restaurants, um, facilities, as we've seen in many of the pictures and as I'm sure students are learning about. Um, so for black athletes to compete um, in the American team and to hopefully come back victorious, would provide them opportunities they might have not had before. Um, but this debate did divide African-American communities. Uh, there's an editorial that we see here on the right-hand side um, by a Baptist minister and Harlem civil rights activist, Adam Clayton Powell. Um, he published this editorial and he lays out, he lays out his reasons for opposing participation in the games. His argument was that there was more at stake for African-Americans than the glory of sports. Um, and what he really felt was that this would be a one-time victorious moment for them and that they were going to come back 
and not be treated any differently than they had been prior to the games. There was also a great amount of um, talk and, and uh, debate among the African-American community that why should they boycott participating in the games? Um, they called out the hypocrisy basically of many American institutions. And, and what I mean by that is that in the mainstream media, um, this hypocrisy was not called out. But in the black press, the hypocrisy of largely white Americans pointing fingers at, at Nazi Germany for being racist, um, were ignoring the fact that racism was alive and well here in the United States. So for example, um, the president of the NAACP at the time actually tried to pressure Jesse Owens to not compete to make the United States look good because his fear was that Jesse Owens and the other athletes would return and experience the segregation that had been gone, ongoing all of their lives. So this was, um, this was really a range of opinions among the communities um, on the debate issue of boycotting the Olympic Games. And we have a lot of information on that in our Holocaust Encyclopedia. And we will provide you with a handout that will be posted on the Institute website that gives you more information for contextualizing this history and finding more resources that can help you teach about the debate to boycott the Olympic Games. Thank you. That's really interesting. Um, and um, I wonder what American uh, Jewish athletes were thinking. Uh, what were their thoughts? Well, it, they had some very particular pressures also uh, put on them. Um, and I want to point that out to, to those of you who are watching this, um, if you consider teaching about this, thinking about the pressures and the motivations that these young athletes faced. Um, because they were not only doing this for themselves, they were doing it for their communities and they were doing it when they were both um, black American athletes and Jewish American athletes were facing racism and anti-Semitism at home. And yet these were they saw these as opportunities for themselves to advance, uh, whether as professional athletes or to gain some kind of uh, standing in society. So it, it creates a lot of pressure on, on both groups of athletes. Um, because they are in many quarters called on to boycott the games. So interestingly enough, we do have the testimony of an athlete named Milton Green. So here we have these two pictures on this slide. And on the left hand side, you see Milton Green. He's on the very left. Um, he was the captain of the Harvard University track team and he took first place in the 110 meter high hurdles in the regional pre-Olympic trials. And next to him was Norman Connors, who was also Jewish, and he also qualified for the final Olympic trials as well. Um, on the right-hand side, you see Sam Stoller and Marty Glickman. Sam Stoller is on the far right, and Marty Glickman is next to him. Marty Glickman went on to become a very prominent sportscaster. He passed away about 20 years ago, but um, I remember seeing him a lot on uh, ESPN and, and other channels. And they did not boycott the games. Um, what happened with Sam Stoller and Marty Glickman was at the last minute, the events that they were going to compete in, they were removed from competition by Avery Brundage. Um, and they were replaced by Jesse Owens and Ralph Metcalf. And it was never known definitively why they were removed, but um, many people believed it was because they were Jewish and that perhaps we didn't want to offend the host uh, country that had very open anti-Semitic laws, such as the Nuremberg laws. Um, so, Marty Glickman spoke about this at different times in his life. Um, so they didn't, even though they went to the games, they were not allowed to compete. Now, Milton Green and Norman Connors, the two young men on the left, chose to boycott the games. So I'm going to play an oral testimony from Milton Green. So if you bear with me just one moment, 
Um, Milton Green, uh, living in Boston, he had grown up in Boston and he went to a reform synagogue there. And the rabbi of his synagogue actually approached him um, to try to convince him to boycott the games. And he's a young, young man. He's only, I think, 17 or 18 years old at this point. So we're going to listen to his testimony about his meeting with his rabbi. Uh, we agreed to come. I didn't know what they were going to talk about, except that uh, something about the Olympics. They told us about the terrible things that were going on in Germany and the Nazi regime. And it was, it was a shocker to me and Norman. They suggested that uh, it might be a good idea for us not to go to the Olympics because of all this, these problems and to sort of register our objections and uh, sort of boycotting the uh, Olympics. And we were quite taken back about that thought. Uh, and they tried to explain to us that we would never regret if we did take that action to boycott the Olympics. And that meeting really turned us around because uh, we were horrified of well, the terrible things that were going on in Germany. Both Connors and I decided that we would boycott the Olympics. We just felt it was the right thing to do. I spoke to the track coach at Harvard. We told him about our intention. He tried to persuade us not to do it. He said he didn't think we'd do much good and uh, uh, we should try to go to the uh, final tryouts and try to make the, the team. But uh, we didn't uh, want to do that. After we boycotted the Olympics, uh, no one came to speak to us or ask us uh, if we'd uh, make any statements about it. And uh, I don't think uh, anyone knew particularly that we did boycott it. So again, um, we, we have these testimonies um, and we also want to just point out one fact that this is 1935, 1936. We did not have yet the killing centers or a final solution and the war had not yet begun. So whatever was decided by individuals, um, we have the full facts or, or many more facts, I should say, not the full facts because we, continual, we are continually discovering more about this history. But at that time, nobody could foresee the conclusion of what would happen at the end of the Holocaust. So um, these these young athletes, again, uh, made difficult decisions. They, they had pressure put on them to either participate or not participate. And in the end, each of them had their own reasons for why they decided to do what they did. Um, and that's something that helps students to understand the pressures and the issues that were happening at the time. So overall, how did ordinary Americans uh, feel about this, um, the, the boycotting of the games? Well, it was a very, um, again, a very contentious issue. And there was a poll that was actually taken by the American Institute of Public Opinion in 1935, about a year before the games were going to take place. Um, and Americans were asked this question, should America refuse to participate in the Olympics games, which are to be held in Germany this coming year? And the majority of Americans, at least in this poll, said that no, we should not refuse to participate. We should not boycott the games. Um, so again, just thinking about the role that public opinion plays in decision making, um, whether it's something related to sports or to politics. And again, as we've said, they mix a lot more than, than um, people want to realize, and we see a lot of examples of that today. Um, but people did have access to information about what was happening in Nazi Germany. Um, we have a newspaper project that's called History Unfolded, and you'll receive the link to that in the handout that will be posted on the Institute website that 
has um, this project history unfolded has a wealth of articles from newspapers across the United States um, that are that are reporting on various things that are happening in Nazi Germany. Um, and so these debates continue in the media. Now with social media, we're much more active in, in these debates, um, whether it's somebody taking a knee um, during the national anthem at a sporting event, or whether it's boycotting um, the games of some years ago, not too long ago, um, there was a debate to boycott the games in China. Um, I'm old enough to remember in 1980 when the United States boycotted the Olympic Games in the former Soviet Union because of the invasion of Afghanistan. So these issues continue to resonate with us today. Uh, so what were the experiences of Black American athletes at the Olympics? There was a great deal of success um, and among uh, black athletes, uh, black American athletes who competed at the Olympic games. And we, um, we have a lot of information on our website and in our Holocaust encyclopedia, which is online, that gives you um, the particular events in which many of them won gold or silver medals. Um, and Jesse Owens, uh, what's, what's very striking, there's a myth about Jesse Owens that Hitler walked out on him, and that was not true. Um, Hitler didn't attend the ceremony uh, in which he was going, he, he did not attend um, the ceremony in which he was given the gold medals because his advisors told him, if you're not going to greet one, you shouldn't be there to greet any of the medalists. So he didn't walk out on him, uh, per se, and we have more information on that on our website. But what is interesting about Jesse Owens and, and very ironic, given these racial states in Germany and given the way that Jesse Owens and others were treated in the United States and subjected to segregation and, and racism overall, um, he was treated like a rock star by many people in the German public. And they... Um, they sought him for his autograph. They wanted to meet him. We have photos of German citizens um, surrounding him because they were they were very taken by him. Um, and he actually developed a very close friendship with the young man right next to him, a German athlete and a long distance uh, runner and sprinter named Lutz Long. Uh, and Jesse Owens in his autobiography actually credits Lutz Long um, for helping him improve his performance, not only physically, but also uh, mentally. And they remained friends after the Olympics and they stayed in touch. And tragically, Lutz Long was killed in the war, but Jesse Owens remained close to the family and actually went to visit the family in Germany a few times. Um, but he did face those pressures again um, in his decision to compete. Um, he was having different voices who were trying to convince him in one way or another uh, what to compete or not to compete. Um, and this raises a question of, of some of the decisions that athletes today have to face. And, and we know about a lot of those decisions and there are debates and there's controversy around them as well. So it was the same in, in 1936. Maybe some reasons were different, but many of the themes are still there. Um, and many of these athletes actually um, later on took up um, civil rights um, advocacy, civil rights work, um, especially as we go into after the war and into the 1950s. Um, so we do have a lot of information um, about this. I think you might be muted. Yes, thank you. Uh, can you tell us about some of the resources that the museum has? I know they must have a lot. We do have quite a bit, um, and we actually make a lot of it available on social media as well. Um, we have a very robust Instagram page where we feature historical photos with the context behind them. And we have a Facebook Live uh, Stay Connected series, 
when the pandemic began, um, we started using social media as a tool to reach even more people. And every Wednesday, every other Wednesday at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, we feature a Facebook Live program on a particular topic with experts being interviewed. And so we were very fortunate. Um, last year, the Olympics were, were postponed because of the pandemic, but it was an opportune time for us to look once again at the Nazi Olympics of 1936 and to look at how black and Jewish athletes um, defied this master race theory um, coming out of Germany. So we record these. If, if you cannot watch the Facebook Live program as it's happening, we do record them. And last year, we um, for this particular Facebook Live program on the Nazi Olympics, we interviewed Dr. Damian Thomas. He's a sports curator at the National Museum of African American History and Culture in here in Washington. And we also interviewed Dr. Daniel Green, who served as the curator of our exhibit, Americans in the Holocaust. And even if you don't use this Facebook Live um, program, this particular program in your classroom, you can use parts of it, or we encourage you as educators to watch it, to learn more of the context um, behind the Olympics, where you also get to hear personal accounts of black and Jewish Americans um, who participated in the in the games of 1936. And the Facebook Live uh, events are great. Uh, so uh, I encourage everybody to watch them. Uh, what did the athletes remember about the Olympics? I'm glad you asked that question because as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we are, our perspectives grow broader in retrospect um, because we're exposed to more information about events, maybe sometime after they've happened. And we were very fortunate that when we were creating an, an exhibit that was at the museum and that was traveling prior to the pandemic, but that we also have online, which you'll receive the link to, um, we were very fortunate that we still had with us some of the athletes like Milton Green, who had competed in the games, and also John Woodruff, um, who also competed uh, for the United States. He was a student at the University of Pittsburgh, um, and he spoke very eloquently about what it meant to him as an American, as a young black man, um, going to Nazi Germany to compete in these games. So um, I'm going to now share my screen with you so that we can hear this presentation. Uh, so if you will bear with me, uh, let me see, let me, let me cancel that. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint. I'm not really used to this, but let me see. Okay. Here we go. So this is John Woodruff um, then and then later in his life. And we're going to go to our Facebook page so that we can hear his remembrances about the Olympic Games. In fact, I never thought in terms of, of, of going into the Olympics. Never thought in terms of that at all. And it was a coach that uh, approached me on it and said he wanted me to try out for the team. When we went to the Olympics, we weren't interested. We weren't interested in politics. We were only interested in going to Germany, participating in our events, and trying to win as many gold medals or medal as we could win. See, and come in. And of course, I wanted to win. Well, it, 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 made me, it made me feel good because what we did destroyed his mass race theory. 
because you know he he had that mass race theory that you know the, the superior race that only 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 the pure Germans could do certain things in this world. That was what he was advocating. But we destroyed his theory whenever we start winning those gold medals. Then when I was graduated and they had the uh, University Hall of Fame, Gerard brought international, international recognition to the school. The All-American football players like Marshall Goldberg, they brought national recognition to the school. They made the Hall of Fame, but I didn't make it. In spite of the gold medal that I'd won and bringing to school, international recognition. That let me know just what the situation was. Things hadn't changed. Things hadn't changed. So um, once again, we we have these resources that, as you can see, are, are very rich. And at the same time, um, they, they show us what the situation was after the games and that struggle to attain equality and not just recognition, but equality. And this is also a way to to go into looking at issues of civil rights at this time. So in other words, when you're teaching about the Holocaust or if you're teaching about a topic like the Olympic Games, it's not a standalone topic, but it does take us into other themes and the continuum of studying history. So we hope that when you review these resources and after you've watched this, that you consider how to integrate these resources into your classroom, um, thinking about your rationale if you teach about the Holocaust, and even if you don't teach specifically about the Holocaust and, and have a Holocaust unit, still as you're teaching about these issues and in a history course or even um, a course that deals with um, more contemporary themes in literature perhaps, you can look at these testimonies and think about what they mean and what they reveal um, about American behavior, uh, behaviors at the time, and about human behavior too as well. So I, I hope that, that this has been helpful to you. And um, we just want to continue to be in touch with you. We would like to continue to hear from you um, because we will continue to work with the school district of, of Palm Beach County. So if you'd like to be in touch with any of us, here is our contact information. Um, we would love to hear how these resources work for you or if you have any suggestions, please let us know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina, and thank you, Maureen. Thank you both for sharing your expertise on the, the Nazi Olympics and more. I wanna just take a minute to add on to, to emphasize the work that you and your team have done during the COVID-19 pandemic to take already fabulous, complete resources and turn them into something that can be used in a virtual classroom. And these are resources that can be used by, like you just said, Holocaust educators, language arts teachers, any content area teacher can visit the museum website and find a complete lesson plan there, starting with the objectives, the learning targets, videos, resources, primary sources, discussion questions, all the way through assessments. I mean, everything is there for you and they are teacher friendly, easy to use. So, so I encourage anybody watching this to check out the United States Holocaust Museum website to access resources on the Nazi Olympics, but on anything having to do with the Holocaust in, in World War II. So thank you for that. And thank you both for being here today. And like, like Christina said, if anybody has any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Thank you.